When discussing London's paranormal history, two locations will inevitably come up, namely the Tower of London and Buckingham Palace. The earliest parts of the Tower of London were laid by William the Conqueror after his Norman army successfully invaded England in 1066, and over the following centuries, new areas were added, expanding the site to its present size and appearance. While the tower has served various purposes over the centuries for each monarch who held the crown of England, ranging from the mundane to the ceremonial, it is its use as a prison that has gained it the most notoriety, and this is not restricted to ancient history, with 12 people imprisoned and executed there on charges of espionage and treason during the two world wars. After the war, it served as a prison for perhaps two of the most well-known criminals of modern British history, namely Ronnie and Reggie Cray, the notorious Cray twins, who were among the last prisoners kept there. Today, the tower is one of the most visited attractions in London, with nearly three million visitors looking to explore the historic site every year, excluding 2020. But if stories are to be believed, the history surrounding the tower may not be as far away as one might perceive. A number of ghosts with royal links are said to haunt the Tower of London, but easily the most famous and widely reported is the spirit of Anne Boleyn. Few need to be told the story of Anne Boleyn, but in a nutshell, she became the second wife of Tudor King Henry VIII after he divorced his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. The divorce severed England from the influence of the Catholic Church, but while the story is often retold, emphasizing the love and passion Anne and Henry shared for one another, its ending would forever solidify the story in the conscious minds of the world ever since. Accused of treason against Henry, adultery, and even of incest with her brother, charges that have long been suspected of being fabricated by a frustrated Henry because she had not bore him a male heir. She was beheaded at the tower on May 19th, 1536, since that fateful day, Anne Boleyn's ghost has been seen in numerous places around the tower, most notably in the Queen's house, where she is said to have stayed the night before her coronation as Queen. Another common location for citing her sad spirit at the tower is at the Chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula, where she was buried under the floor the day she was executed. In the late 19th century, a captain of the guard noticed a light coming from inside the locked chapel late one night, and after placing a ladder against the wall, he climbed up to peer into the chapel windows to investigate. According to the story, the captain witnessed a procession of knights and ladies, dressed in historic costumes, walking slowly down the aisle, and led by an elegant female whose face was averted from him. But it did not matter, for he knew who she was. He had seen her portrait many times, and so he was of no doubt that the woman at the front of this ghostly procession was none other than Anne Boleyn. What makes the sighting all the more fascinating is that it came shortly after Anne Boleyn's remains were exhumed from under the chapel on the orders of Queen Victoria in order for her to be given a more decent burial. Another well-known tale of Anne's ghost comes from 1864 when a sentry claimed to have seen her spectre hovering over the ground dressed all in white. He reportedly challenged her to identify herself and when she appeared to be moving towards him without responding, he charged at her with a bayonet. After the weapon went straight through her form, he realized he was dealing with an apparition, and after which struck him with a blue fiery flash that knocked him unconscious. Recounting the experience, he later identified the spirit as that of Anne Boleyn. This event almost repeated itself in 1933, when another sentry had a remarkably similar encounter which saw him abandon his post in terror. While startling encounters, they are not as tragic as that of another century over a century earlier in 1817. The unfortunate man suffered a heart attack after seeing her on a stairway and lived long enough to tell others what happened before he died. But Anne Boleyn is by no means the only spirit to haunt the tower. An equally tragic tale surrounding the castle is that of the princes in the tower and concerns 12-year-old Edward V and his nine-year-old brother Richard of Shrewsbury, who were locked in the tower by Richard III. The two brothers then mysteriously disappeared, 
and it's been widely speculated that Richard III had them murdered. Since then, their ghosts have been seen in various rooms in the Tower of London, often holding hands as though the two of them were looking for comfort from one another. In recent years, there have been several images to emerge, claiming to have captured the boys' ghosts. In 2015, medium Christine Hamlet released a photograph she took, which claims to depict the boys' ghosts, walking beside one another with heads bowed solemnly. Another famous ghost said to walk the halls of the tower belongs to Sir Walter Raleigh, originally imprisoned for 12 years at the tower before being released after upsetting King James VI. He lost his head on October 29th, 1618, and his spirit has been seen regularly around Bywar Tower by guards and visitors. One of the lesser known spectres said to haunt the tower is that of a phantom bear, which like Anne Boleyn's ghost, appeared to take great pleasure in tormenting centuries during the 19th century. The tower is also the site of a curious story retold by Edmund Swift, keeper of the crown jewels in 1817. He reported discovering what appeared to be a glass tube full of strange blue liquid that bubbled as he was later having dinner with his family in their lodgings within the jewel tower. Eventually he hit it with a chair after his wife shrieked in horror, claiming that whatever was inside had tried to grab her, but the chair went straight through the glass and the substance which then seemed to disappear through a wall. Less than three and a half miles away from the tower sits the grandeur of Buckingham Palace, the royal family's London residence, and the administrative headquarters of the British monarchy. Originally christened Buckingham House, the palace's origins can be traced back to 1703 and the Duke of Buckingham, until it was acquired by King George III in 1761 to be used as a private residence for Queen Charlotte. It did not take on its current role until the accession of Queen Victoria to the throne in 1837, after which it underwent considerable expansion. While not sharing the paranormal fame that is attached to the Tower of London, Buckingham Palace has its fair share of ghosts roaming its grounds, with some researchers claiming there are numerous entities sharing residence with the royal household. Even Prince Charles is said to have expressed his belief that spirits of the royal family's past still reside at the palace, including reported sightings of Queen Victoria robed in her black clothes as she continues to mourn her husband, Albert. However, it is two specific ghosts that have garnered the most attention from staff at the palace. The land upon which the original house was constructed sits on top of the site of a former monastery and it is said that the ghost of a monk who died in his cell now haunts the palace's rear terrace. As well as sightings of the ghostly monk, there have also been numerous reports of an invisible chain rattling, as well as moaning on the terrace at night. Perhaps the saddest tale of haunting at Buckingham Palace comes from the death of Major John Gwynne in 1910. During the reign of King Edward VII, between 1901 and 1910, Gwynne served as the king's private secretary. However, he caused quite an upset when he divorced his wife, something that was seriously frowned upon at the time, causing Gwynne to become depressed, as he was ostracized by his peers, until finally he could take no more and shot himself in the head in the first floor office of the palace. Since then, staff have reported a strange aura in the room and supposedly a single gunshot has sometimes been heard coming from there, as though Gwen had been doomed to repeat his death over and over. Reflecting Britain itself, London underwent a great deal of change in the 20th century. Some of it was spurred on by the natural evolution of a growing city while some of it was the result of destruction wrought upon the metropolis by two world wars. In the 20th century, London also underwent a major cultural change. The city once seen as being the place of dark, soot-filled streets in the working class areas and stuffy, suited men in the upper class areas became the scene of vibrant colors and music. As the swinging 60s dawned and the youth displaced the older generations 
as the main focus of city life. The city also saw a growing immigrant population coming from the British Commonwealth, looking for work and bringing with them their own culture, making London one of the most diverse, multicultural and international capitals in the world. And yet, the ghosts of the past, some figuratively, and some may say literally, continue to haunt the capital. Given the huge loss of life sustained by heavy bombing during the Second World War especially, spiritualism saw a resurge in the first half of the century as grieving men and women tried to make contact with lost loved ones. However, some of those who were lost appear to haven't truly left at all. Biggin Hill was an airfield heavily engaged in defending the city from the Luftwaffe during the Blitz, and is now home to a museum commemorating those brave individuals. However, residents in the nearby village often tell of a phantom Spitfire fighter from that dark chapter of history still attempting to make its way back to the airfield. Sometimes the aircraft is silent, despite its propellers turning, implying its engine is switched on, while other times there is only the sound of the engine, as the aircraft remains invisible, at least to the living. Additionally, the residents have also told stories of cars being flagged down by a small group of airmen wearing World War II era uniforms, asking for directions to the airfield, only to vanish soon after. One of the more tragic ghost stories to emerge in this era concerns the Greenwich Foot Tunnel, a 370 meter long tunnel connecting Greenwich to the Isle of Dogs in the Thames River. Many who have braved walking the tunnel at night have reported seeing the ghostly apparitions of a couple dressed in Victorian era and holding hands as they stroll along the tunnel before disappearing into thin air. Investigators have never been able to come up with identities for the couple, which leads to presumptions that they may have died together, either by accident, violence or suicide, but regardless of which, they are together now. A curious case involving the damaged house at number 16 Montpelier Road in Ealing, towards the end of World War II, would have a profound impact on the young boy who had his first paranormal experience there. The young boy, named Andrew Green, was passing the damaged house with his father when he decided to go exploring inside, and in particular, of the short tower that protruded from the top of the building. Green claimed that as he ascended up a ladder to the tower's zenith, he felt something gripping and helping him climb. As he looked out over the roofs of West London, he claims to have heard a voice in his head telling him to walk over the parapets into the garden. The voice said to him, it's only 12 inches down to the lawn, you won't hurt yourself. But just as he was ready to jump, his father grabbed hold of him to stop him. Green also claims that there were a number of unusual symbols carved into the wall at the top of the tower. Andrew Green was so affected by the experience, he would become a prolific paranormal investigator in later life, earning the nickname of the Spectre Inspector. Returning to the origin of his interest in the field, he began an investigation into the house, and found that it was the scene of a horrifying 20 suicides over a 60 year period. And had his father not been there to stop him, it's possible he could have been the 21st. Not so lucky was a 12 year old girl who leapt from the tower in 1887. Throughout the time it was occupied, the house was reportedly a hotbed for paranormal activity between the suicides and even after it was abandoned. Workers who attempted to repair the property for sale found themselves unable to stay in the building for more than a few hours. Investigators who visited the property have captured several images of spectres on camera, including one supposedly of the little girl. The house has since been demolished and a block of flats called Eglin Court now sits in its place. But even so, residents of the flats have reported strange goings on. Another chilling case can be found at the Rising Sun Public House in Cloth Fair. In the late 1980s, two barmaids who were living upstairs at the pub reported experiencing a ghostly presence that would sit at the end of their beds and then try to remove their sheets. A few years later, the landlady of the pub was taking a shower when she felt an icy cold hand run down her spine, but when she turned around to see who was touching her, there was no one there. 
Local legend tells of a group of body snatchers who would frequent the pub in the 19th century, when it was commonplace for such criminals to acquire fresh bodies to sell to doctors for experimentation. And it's suspected the spirit of at least one of these snatchers is responsible for the activity. Another public house, the Bow Bells, has another spirit that likes to taunt the female patrons, albeit in a less insidious but still unnerving manner. Since the 1970s, the pub has had a spat of reports of women using the restroom, only to have unseen hands yank the chain down, causing the toilet to flush. It sounds comical, but it became such a nuisance that in 1974, a seance was held at the pub in an attempt to rid the building of the ghostly culprit. It failed, and the phantom flusher was reported being active up until the 2000s. But perhaps one of the more controversial cases to emerge in this period was that of the so-called Enfield poltergeist. In August 1977, police were called to the home of Peggy Hodgson and her children in the London borough of Enfield. When the police arrived, she claimed that she had witnessed furniture moving and that two of her four children had heard loud knocking against the walls of the house. One of the police officers who responded later explained that while she was making inquiries into the disturbance, she observed a chair start to wobble and then slide across the floor seemingly of its own accord. This attracted the interest of journalists who visited the property and observed the phenomena, which appeared to increase to include disembodied voices, loud unexplained noises, objects fly across the room of their own accord, chairs overturning, and even Mrs. Hodgson's children levitating across the room. The journalist contacted the Society for Psychic Research, who dispatched inventor Maurice Gross and investigator and author Guy Lyon Playfair to investigate. Over a period of 18 months, more than 30 people, including neighbours, the researchers, journalists and visitors, all reported witnessing the startling phenomena. Eventually, Maurice was able to record the entity speaking through Janet Hodgson, one of the children, who explained that he was a former occupant of the house and who died in a chair downstairs. The whole affair was covered in Playfair's book, This House is Haunted, but from the earliest reports, some skeptics accused the children of being responsible for the activity. They even went as far to accuse Janet of engaging in ventriloquism to produce the disembodied voice. However, Janet and her siblings have remained adamant that they were not behind any of the activity and Maurice defended his belief that the house was haunted for the rest of his life. And with renewed interest in the case 50 years later, thanks to movies and television shows, supporters and skeptics continue to debate just what really did happen in that house for that year and a half. Becoming possibly just as iconic a landmark as Buckingham Palace, the Tower of London, or Nelson's Column, London's historic underground subway system is one of the most recognisable parts of the modern city. Known colloquially as the Tube, the modern London underground network can trace its origins back to the London Metropolitan Railway, which opened in 1863 and was the world's first underground passenger transport system. Today, up to 2 million passengers board the electric trains, along 250 miles of track, serving 270 stations every day. Given the utilitarian nature of the London Underground, it's easy to forget that it has its own fascinating history. As already mentioned, it gave the world the first underground rail passenger network, which is now a common feature in many major cities around the world. It allowed people to move around London far quicker than before when using horse and carts, and opened up much of the city to the wider population. In over a century and a half of operation, five babies have been born on the tube, two of which occurred in 2019, but perhaps one of its most famous roles was to provide shelter from air raids for Londoners during the Blitz. However, the tube is also the scene for many tragedies, on December 19th, 1866, a large steel girder over the tracks at Barbican Station, now Aldersgate, 
fell onto a carriage, killing 68-year-old Sarah Johnson, who became the tube's first fatality. On February 28, 1975, at 8.46am, a busy commuter train crashed into a wall as it reached the end of the line at Moorgate Station. 43 people were killed and 74 injured, making it the worst peacetime disaster to befall the underground. The cause of the crash was determined to lay with the driver, who either unintentionally or deliberately failed to stop at the station. However, it was during the Second World War that the London Underground would see its greatest tragedy. On March 3rd, 1943, as a crowd of people were entering Bethnal Green Station to take shelter from an air raid, an anti-aircraft battery in nearby Victoria Park launched a salvo of anti-aircraft rockets into the air. This caused the crowd to surge forward, believing the bombing was about to start. A woman tripped on the stairs, causing many others to fall over her, and in the chaos that followed, 173 people were crushed to death. Despite these tragedies, the London Underground is still one of the safest and most efficient ways to travel around London today. On average, the tube suffers just one fatality for every 300 million journeys. And even then, the majority of these are suicides, which cannot be attributed to any factors regarding the system itself. But with such tragic stories in its past, it is little wonder that the tube is well known for its hauntings. Staff working at Bethnal Green Station have often reported hearing the sounds of what many believe to be the cries of those crushed to death during the war. Sometimes the sounds are solitary in nature, such as that of a whimpering child or a crying woman, but other times, staff members have reported hearing a wave of frightened and panicked voices. In one instance, a lone worker at the station reported hearing the commotion for some 15 minutes, prompting him to leave the station in terror. In 1984, a trainee manager was walking the line near South Island Place alone as part of his training, where he encountered a solitary worker walking the other way, holding a tilly lamp. The two of them exchanged pleasantries and then continued on their way. However, when he informed staff at the end of his walk, he was told no one should have been in the tunnel. They organized a search for the man before trains began to run along the line again, but he was nowhere to be found. The trainee manager was then told that he was by no means the first person to have encountered the ghostly man. But the hauntings of the London Underground do not appear to be a relatively recent occurrence, nor are they limited to people. In 1928, an entire spectral train was reported passing through Kensington Station at the end of the working day. According to the reports, a phantom worker wearing a reefer coat and flat cap clung to the railings on the ghost train as it disappeared into the tunnel, giving out a faint whistle as it departed. Another ghost train has been sighted running between East Finchley and the Wellington sidings. One of the more unexpected hauntings linked to the underground concerns that of an Egyptian princess. Between 1900 and 1933, the British Museum had a dedicated station that included artifacts from Egypt. The disturbing of these artifacts are blamed for the princess haunting the station during the time it was operational, with visitors and staff reporting her terrifying screams, which were said to be so loud that they could be heard as far down the tunnel as the next station. Some reports claim that the screams can still be heard coming from the closed station. One of the more famous hauntings centers around the murder of one William Terrace on December 16, 1897. Terrace, a professional and well-liked actor, was stabbed to death in the Adolphi Theater by another actor, Richard Archer Price, who had become mentally unstable. Since then, Terrace's ghost has been seen both in the Adelphi Theater and standing on a platform at Covent Garden Station, which is unusual since the station was built after Terrace's untimely death. Equally curious, or at least coincidental, the station adjacent to Covent Garden is Holborn, less than half a mile down the track, and whose opening would render the nearby British Museum station unnecessary. It is at Holborn, where the Egyptian princess's screams are reported to still be heard coming from the direction of the abandoned station. And this gives us an idea of just how dense the hauntings of the underground can be in places. Q 
Given the wide array of sightings through history in London, it would be easy to dismiss the reports as something of the past, but this is far from the case. London continues to be a hotbed of paranormal activity, and there seems to be no let up anytime soon. In the 2010s, Holborn Library saw a spat of activity, including an archivist using a mirror in the third floor bathroom, glimpsing a person walk behind her. Surprised, she turned around to face the visitor, but was horrified to find that where she had seen the person standing in the mirror, there was nothing but empty space. More dramatically, an art curator on the fourth floor, which at the time was not in use, was violently pushed in the shoulder by an unseen presence. Finally, a cleaner working in the basement was seen running out of the building in terror and refused to go back in. When staff tried to ask her what she had seen, she was reportedly too terrified to even say. The Haymarket Theatre Royal is said to be haunted by a ghost who only shows himself if an upcoming performance will be successful. Known as Buckstone, Star Trek actor Patrick Stewart reportedly spotted the ghost during a performance of Waiting for Godlet. The ghost of a former manager of the theatre, David Morris, is also reported to return every few years to the theatre, just to cause trouble for a single night. A frightening incident occurred at an apartment in Vanden Court in 2005. The owner of the apartment returned home to discover a man wearing a US Air Force uniform and holding a clipboard waiting for them. The man was said to be a handsome and happy chap and extended their hand, which the owner accepted, but upon contact with it, they felt extreme cold, causing them to scream, which alerted neighbors. By the time they arrived, the US Air Force man had vanished. In 2018, Jane Cunningham was taking photos of her family at the Bethnal Green Museum on her iPhone when she noticed two girls in the background of some of the pictures that she is certain were not there at the time. The two women appear Asian in appearance and are apparently dressed in oriental clothing. Additionally, in one picture, there appears to be a purple skull-shaped orb alongside them. Mrs. Cunningham was so intrigued that she conducted research into the history of the building and made a shocking discovery. She found that the building was constructed in the 17th century and a number of immigrant women were employed to decorate it. She believes that the two women in the picture were one of those who were brought to Britain at the time. Given that the stories of London's hauntings are largely centered on tales of melancholy, we feel it only right to end on a less bleak story from recent years. Originating in the wake of the Great Fire of London in 1666, many people have reported sighting a white being floating over the Thames River and experiencing feelings of hope and joy upon sighting it. Dubbed the Angel of the Thames, the being has been sighted repeatedly over the centuries since the Great Fire often being seen as giving help or simply reassurance to those who need it, even if they do not realize they do. In 2006, student Jemima Waterhouse was en route to meet a friend when she spotted a strange, wispy light hovering close to the Thames Queen Mary floating restaurant and immediately felt a sense of comfort and peace. She quickly photographed the apparition with her phone and viewing it on her computer, she saw the distinct outline of what appeared to be an angel. Like many mysterious events, there are those who believe the angel is paranormal or supernatural in origin, and then there are those who argue that it is some natural phenomena or a hoax. We guess the fact of the matter is, as always has been the case, people will only see what they believe is the truth.